For those of you that don't know, I'm Susie Silbert, and I'm the curator of Modern and Contemporary Glass here. And it is my distinct honor to be introducing the 32nd Reikau Commission and my personal second Reikau Commission, um, Carlin, Dr. Carlin Sutherland. Um, as most of you know, the Reikau Commission is something that was started in 1986 and is an award um, typically granted in the last several years to an artist that isn't currently represented in the collection and also for the last several years um, is granted to an emerging artist. And I feel, I felt like this last year, but now that I have been here for uh, another year, I can tell you um, that I think that this is one of the most important things that the museum does um, to ensure the continued high level um, uh, production of glass um, in, in the world. And I think that you will find the same when you hear Carlin talk and when you go and see her piece, if you haven't, um, if you haven't already. And I thought in just the few minutes that I have up here, I would tell you a little bit, unless you are going to talk about it, Carlin, about how this particular piece came to be. No, okay, great, I got the go ahead. Um, be because I think it's important, um, it's important to, to thinking about Carlin's work and, um, and especially about why it's important to come and see it in person. So I was lucky enough to have had some spies out in the world that saw a piece of Carlin's in this series in the European Glass Context show um, in Bornholm. And I thought, this is interesting. I thought, this is interesting because I don't understand this. And I have spent a lot of my life looking at glass and understanding what I see. And, I, uh, I, and any time I am given pause like that, I think it's something to consider a little bit more. And then I was lucky to be sitting on a couple of different jury panels for residencies and for New Glass Review, amongst others, that Carlin had submitted to. And in fact, in New Glass Review, if you look through last year's copy, New Glass Review 38, you'll see that there's a piece of Carlin's in there, but it's not a work from this series because all of us as jurors saw the image and thought that it wasn't actually glass. In fact, we thought it was a digital rendering of glass that she proposed to make. And of course, that's not something that you can show in New Glass Review. And so it was my distinct, exciting honor when Carlin was here last winter as a resident. Um, I told her this. I said, you know, the reason we didn't put one of those in New Glass Review was we couldn't understand it from photos. And Carlin, being savvy, said, what if I shipped one of those pieces here? Do you think you could help me figure out how to photograph it better? <laughs> By that point, I was pretty sure that we needed one of these pieces in the collection before I had even seen it in person, particularly because it does stretch our understandings of what the material is, what it can do, what it can say. And then when I saw the piece in person, I was completely bowled over, as I hope that you will be as if, when you go upstairs, because there's something about the piece, even though when you see it in person, it looks a little bit like it might still be a projection or might be something that appears on a screen, a TV screen. There's something about it, the physicality of it, that you just can't get in a photograph. And I hope that it makes you reconsider your relationship to the material, your relationship to space, and your relationship to the possibilities. And without further ado, Carlin. <laughs> Hello, and thank you, Susie, for that wonderful introduction. I feel like she's told you all the spoilers, so that's okay. You've said all the good stuff. Um, so I'm going to start by talking a bit about my background, where I'm from, and how I came to be working in glass, because my background is actually in architecture. And I will speak very briefly about some early work and how I started, but really, what I want to speak about is the work that I've made in the last two or three years that's really been instrumental in me coming to stand before you here. Um, so I'll start with Leipster in Caithness, which is where I'm from. It's a, a small village in the North Highlands of Scotland. Um, my father's family are from here. He was born here. I grew up here and I lived there until I was 18 and I went to 
university in Edinburgh. And very much to my surprise, I found myself back there uh, when I was finishing my PhD um, many years later. And I'm still in the area, which is still a surprise. But. Um, so historically, Leipzig was famous as a fishing port. There was a herring boom in Scotland during the 19th century. And at the peak of that, Leipzig was the third largest herring port in the country, which is quite a big claim to fame for such a small place. Um, but more recently, it's become famous um, as the home of Northlands Creative, formerly Northlands Creative Glass, which I know many of you will have heard of. Um, and it was established in 1996 as a center, an international center for excellence in glassmaking. And the building that the studio is housed in that you can see here was formerly a village school. Um, and my dad actually did some of his technical drawing and things in um, the building. So it's, it's kind of nice to have known it in a different guise, I suppose, many years later. And the studio is right in the middle of the village. Um, I started working in glass in 2009 after taking a master class at Northlands. Um, but prior to that, I'd never actually been over the door. And like a lot of people who lived locally, I, oh, sorry, I've skipped on. I didn't know anything about it. Um, and I, I was just, yeah, I mean, I worked in a local hotel and I hadn't seen in the summers when there were master classes and conferences, various people coming in and you get to know names because people are there for quite a length of time and it's a small town, so you recognize new faces. Um, and so I became acquainted with names and faces and would you know, look people up on the internet so I kind of knew what they did and everybody seemed lovely and very interesting. So at that time, or it was just before she was artistic director, but Jane Bruce was there and Jane later came to be quite important in me starting in glass. And Bertel Valine was, um, was a very prominent memory in a lot of ways. And we used to, I was telling this as a kind of an anecdote last night when I didn't think I was gonna tell it tonight, but I've started, so I guess I'm kind of committed. Um, when we used to work in the hotel, it was quite a small staff, so we would quite often switch between being front of house and doing housekeeping. Um, so I cleaned Bertel Valine's bath when he left the Portland Arms, <laughs> never knowing, of course, that we would be in the, uh, the same museum together at some point. So. Um, there you go. So um, I left Leicester in 2002 to study architecture at Edinburgh College of Art, um, and then at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and this is a fairly typical view from the architecture studios there. And when I left Leipster, I, I didn't ever really think I would be back. I didn't really feel like it held a lot for me. I mean, I loved it, but I didn't, I just felt there had to be more to life and more out there in the world for me. Um, and I was just actually nearing the end of my master's degree in 2008 at the College of Art, and I was offered a research scholarship and at that time, the recession was just starting and everything was thrown into turmoil. And I was never not going to take the scholarship because that's just the kind of person that I am. <laughs> but it was also a really great opportunity to understand more about my ideals as a designer. Um, because I think, you know, by that time, I, I was really starting to get a grasp, but I hadn't really hit on it exactly. And I was quite disillusioned by I suppose the way things were in the profession at the time, and there was a lot of star architects and a lot of statement architecture that seemed kind of very empty of meaning, and that really didn't appeal to me. So I said yes um, to the scholarship, and it turned out to be the best decision that I ever made, although there were many points along the way, especially when I was writing up, that it felt like the worst decision that I had ever made. Um, so my starting point, for my research had been my master's degree, which I started to look at in environmental psychology, and in particular, place, and what it is that brings people back to place. What can architects do when they're building, or when they're designing buildings, that can communicate something or draw people back? And so I started reading about place, I read environmental psychology papers written in a very scientific way. And a lot of them were 
set in laboratories, the studies were, you know, laboratory based and not actually in places. But when I was reading the findings and the conclusions, I would relate it back to my own sense of place and my own relationship with home. And then I started to read about Northlands because I knew that it brought people back repeatedly. And I went into the university library and I looked up every article that I could find. And there was one that was written by Dan Klein. He described it as a life-changing place and that many people who'd visited said that Leibster was life-changing. And I thought, oh yeah, sure, like, <laughs> I don't think so. But it was also, nobody says that, I mean, it's a very big statement to make. So I was curious enough that I thought, okay, I'll apply for a place on a master class with the intention of going and watching other people to see what they were responding to. Um, and so that's what I did. And 2009, I took my first master class at Northlands. It was led by Jane Bruce and Bruno Romanelli. This is Jane out in the middle of the North Sea several years later. Um, and Jane was really, has and was and still is really kind of instrumental, I think, in pushing me forward. And I always credit Jane whenever I speak about how I've ended up doing what I'm doing. And I think that she has a really remarkable ability to just make you ask yourselves the right questions. She doesn't ask them, but she puts you in a position where you, you're the one that's asking them and then she helps you find the answer. So, yeah, it's all really down to Jane in a lot of ways. And so during that class, we went out around the county looking at various places. And of course, none of these places were new to me. They're places that I had seen a lot growing up. And um, one of them was the Campster Cairn. So they're Neolithic burial chambers and they're about nine miles away from Leibster. Um, and I'd seen them many times growing up and never really taken the time to stop and study them in any depth at all. And yeah, at this point, you know, I had I knew nothing about glass. I'd never worked with it before. Like I said, I'd never been over the door at Northlands. And I was really very adamant that I was there to observe other people. And I was even more adamant that whatever I made was going to have nothing to do with architecture, which obviously has, <laughs> you, will, I mean, you can probably guess how that panned out. Um, so this is, the first piece actually that I ever made um, in glass and it's, this is quite a typical process for me I suppose of visiting a place, documenting it through photos and drawings and then a piece that results. And it's, it's really interesting actually to look back on this because it's not a million miles away from what is hanging on the wall upstairs. Uh, but it took me a really long time to see it. I really, I still didn't even really see the architectural connection at this stage. It was many years later when I was writing up my thesis that I saw it. Um, and this really set the tone for the next few years where I kept making, like I, I felt on the second day of that class, Jane turned and said, you've gone quiet, what's wrong? And I said, oh, well, you know, I think maybe I might have made a mistake and maybe I should have studied glass. And her, fa her, her face and Bruno's face fell and Bruno said, no, like you're, don't say that. Um, but really what was wrong that I had spent the year previous to that class not making, there'd been no architectural models, there'd been very little drawings, and I just hadn't been hands-on, and I really missed that, and I, I didn't realize this till much later down the line, so I had quite a period of time where I was kind of tortured about whether all this time studying architecture, maybe, and it wasn't the thing for me, but it was, so all ended well. And so prior to working in glass, I think that my approach to light, which is something that's really important in my work, is light and atmosphere. My approach to that had actually, had really erred on the practical side. I'm from a very practical family. We're very kind of straightforward thinkers. Um, and I was at home the following summer after the class, and I had this, this like throwaway conversation with my father about these buildings that I had just been going out on my own and photographing and drawing and thinking about what I could make in response. And a lot of them have windows that are boarded up and I said to him, you know, I really want to be able somehow to visualize the shaft of light in that space 
but without Photoshop or anything like that. I want to see it naturally. And he said, and now he doesn't really do very much cooking in um, our household, and, but at Christmas time he makes something called a clutie dumpling, which is a boiled sponge. And it, you, you boil it in a piece of muslin, it's a fruit sponge. And we have it at Christmas time. So he said, why don't you take that piece of cloth, that piece of muslin, and fill it with flour, tie it in a knot, and shake it in front of the shaft of light. And so that's exactly what I did. And that actually, I mention this now because it's something that is, became very important um, at a later stage. Um, and I also, I've included an action shot. And I show this nearly every time I speak about it. And he hasn't always known about it. So I guess he will know about it this time. So here is his five minutes of, fo his five minutes of fame and my acknowledgement of, uh, of his uh, contribution to this. And so, like I said, this was really, you know, that first study with Jane really set the tone for the work that was to come afterwards. And everything I made was a maquette, it was a model for something. It, they were all very small scale thoughts about solids and voids, light and shadow, and that play of atmosphere and light within a space. And then much later on towards the end of my research, my PhD was winding up, I had, I'd become to realize that my, these maquettes, these small scale pieces that I'd been making were really an extension of my model making, which now seems very obvious, my, my architectural model making that I had been doing all throughout my education. And I, I started to think about what it was that my research was going to be proposing. And I was really very sure that I had the answers and I was going to solve the ills of the profession with my PhD um, for about five minutes. And I was really convinced that architects just need to draw and make more when they're out on a site and really engage with the place. Because so much is done by computer and it's so it just creates this, it is literally a screen between you and this place. And there's not really an engagement to the same level. So I felt I'd nailed it and that, you know, the answer was to, to do more making by hand. Um, and then I read about perspective drawing, which, and I already had known this, but it, you know, has slipped my mind somewhere. But perspective drawing doesn't give you a view that you can ever see in reality. It's a false view. And because it's unattainable, it actually, even though, you know, the process of drawing, it still creates a distance between, you know, the artist and the piece or the viewer and the, you know, the image that results. And I thought that that was something that was really interesting, not so much for my architectural practice, but for my evolving glass practice. So I started to do these perspective drawings of local buildings and started to figure out a way to deconstruct them so that I could rebuild them as three-dimensional forms that were compressed and still retain some of that perspective quality. And this went on for a really long time. It took me forever to figure out the geometry of how to get these things to fold up from one piece of card or paper. And I think, I, you know, I was particularly interested in detachment as well as attachment because really you don't have one without the other and they're really just opposite ends of the scale. And that I think is true in the work that I make today. I have two quite distinct bodies of work, but to me they come from the same place and the same train of thought. They're about either feeling a, you know, a really strong pull to a place or it's about having a disconnection. And we're all just somewhere on that scale at any point in time. And that's really what appeals about the subject area is that it is some, something that affects everybody. So these were, again, very small models that I made that I, I thought, well, if I make these in cardboard, of course I can cast them in glass very naively um, and I tried I tried for a very long time and I had limited success but I really I couldn't get past the the idea of perspective and what it was and then I wrapped up my PhD eventually and I graduated in 2014 after 12 years at college my parents were very pleased to see the end of that as was I um, and when I graduated I did I felt like I was 
like I had to pick a camp, you know, like I had to pick architecture or glass. And I, I knew I just had such a strong instinct when I was making that I knew it was the right thing, but I still couldn't really find the words to justify it. I didn't really know, it was just the sense that I was compelled to make. And my research, as I'd gone, the theory was always a step ahead. And the theory was so well resolved, but I knew that in making I had a ways to go and I knew that I kind of had more in the tank. So I made the decision after graduation not to go into academia or into architectural practice full time, but to really take a run at being a glass artist, at being a maker, and just to see where that middle ground between glass and architecture would take me. Um, and so then in 2015, I was part of a group show at um, Bullseye Projects in Portland. And I started making these works, you know, going back to the perspective drawings, because I still hadn't resolved really how to cast these forms. And so this series, really at this point, I started to make work that was more about places that I had a connection with or a story with, because the work previously had been me just going out and responding to spaces that I thought were interesting for whatever reason. Um, and so just as I was starting to think about making work for the show, a really good friend of mine had a kidney transplant. And he also, he doesn't know that I made a work about this, so there's a lot of revelations when everybody gets to watch this back on YouTube in a month or so. Um, and he had a, a kidney transplant in the winter and would have to go back and forth to our nearest big hospitals a couple of hours drive away. So I, you know, at the time I was not in, you know, full-time regular employment, so I was the designated driver and I would drive him back and forth to hospital appointments. So we spent a lot of time in corridors and waiting rooms, you know, going up and down stairs. So this series of three pieces, which again are quite small scale, were all about that. And this is, the, the pieces are really about the implied space in the middle, that you, the space that's inaccessible. That's what I was really interested in at this point. But I couldn't resolve how to make the pieces because I wanted a matte surface. I didn't want something that was glossy. But I couldn't figure out, I couldn't cut the glass fine enough. I couldn't cut the black thin enough to get those lines. So the line that's in the middle, the gray line, is enamel. And then I would cold work the front surface of the glass, the, the translucent white, and then it's oil paint on the surface. Which, you know, I'm not adverse to mixed media, but I thought there has to be a better way to resolve this. And then this is the piece that Susie referred to that was in uh, the European Glass Context show in Bornholm. And this was the same I had tried again to resolve. I'd used, I'd been to working in a different studio and I'd started to use different enamels. Um, but I still couldn't get past this, you know, when you fire the enamel, you're firing the surface of the glass so you get a gloss. So I still couldn't really get past that. But the work was starting to get a little bit bigger and the forms were getting, you know, it was a little bit more well resolved. So then, a few years later, came the buyer at Latherin House, which I knew about for maybe three years before the show was actually installed. And Latherin House is owned by Lanny McGregor and Dan Schwer, who I'm thrilled are here with us this evening. Um, and they own Bullseye Glass Company in Portland. And so the building to the right of the house with the low roof is a barn, or what we would call a buyer in Caithness. And um, I was invited to show in the buyer alongside Michael Rogers, who's also with us tonight, and uh, Sylvia Levinson and Emily Natchison. Um, so Latherin Wheel, where Latherin House is, is about four miles south of Leipster. And it was formerly a stone barn, and it, it was renovated enough to, to make it wind and watertight, and a functional exhibition space, but to still retain so much of its character. Um, and the four of us who were exhibiting all had our own space. And I had work that was formerly in the space that was formerly a stable. So after years of making work that was scaled down pieces that were you know, about an architectural experience, I finally had the opportunity to work on a bigger scale. 
And so Michael and Emily and I spent a few weeks together in Caithness that summer, and we split our time between the barn and between the studio at Northlands. And I, you know, I'd been quite daunted by being kind of given this space to work in, and there were no parameters and no, you know, no suggestions about what I should do. And I put a lot of pressure on myself because I thought, well, this is a space, it's an architectural volume, you are something of an architect, you should know what you're doing. Um, and that went on for quite a while. It took me a really long time, actually, to get over that. And it wasn't until that summer where Emily and Michael and I sat and had just conversations, and we all realized that we were all equally insecure about our own position of what we were going to make. And I think realizing that everybody suffers from that, regardless you know, of the stage in the career, really helped to settle me, because I had felt for quite a long time something of a red herring, I suppose, because my background's in architecture and not in glass, and I just didn't, yeah, I felt like I stuck out, and nobody ever made me feel like that. It was purely down to my own insecurity, I guess. So that, you know, I started to settle down a bit, and I still didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I spent a lot of time in the barn watching and documenting the paths of light in that space, and I started tracing the movement of the light in chalk. And then I went back to throw in some flour just to illuminate the light so something that was usually intangible became physical. And I was thinking a lot about time, you know, both within my own lifetime and also the historical connection and how old the barn was and the stories that, you know, no doubt had gone down in that space that we would never know about. And I knew that I wanted to make work that somehow interacted with the tracings that I'd made. So I went to the computer and I made a three-dimensional, a sketch-up model of the whole space. And I also marked on all of my chalk marks. And I figured out how I wanted to cut these shafts of light. I knew, figured out the angle of how the light had, you know, where it had been coming from through the roof lights in the space and how I was going to create these slivers of light. And I also, uh, Michael pointed this out to me, actually once we installed the show, and it never occurred to me until then, but it is really a way of telling time. And there's also a connection to Neolithic burial grounds and I suppose how they were positioned in relation to the sun and the moon, um, which is something that's quite interesting because that's something that I have thought about a lot in other contexts, but never really associated with my own work. So I knew that each of these pieces that would hang in that space, I wanted to be illuminated for a fleeting second um, each year. So I started throwing glass powder instead of flour. And I made some tests. I was fortunate enough to do a month-long residency um, at Bill's Eye Glass Company in Portland in the September before the show opened. And I was looking at I mean, how to balance a really spare geometry with the gesture of a hand. And so this is the work then that resulted in the barn. And there are five pieces in total. And I, I wanted to guide the viewer through the space. So the pieces are hung at different heights and in different, you know, they project out into the space in different ways or they're parallel to walls. And the way that I have thrown the powder onto the surface also relates to how I move through the space and how I threw the flower when I was, you know, documenting my own experience. And it wasn't until I was in the space by myself for the first time and we turned the lights on, and everything was hung and finished. And it really was an aha moment. I understood all of a sudden so much more about what I was doing. <laughs> like, because I hadn't really been able to put words to it before. I just was doing it, and it felt right. And I couldn't explain it to any, anybody, so everybody thought I was having some kind of crisis, I suppose. Um, but it really taught me so much about my own interests in place, you know, how important light is. But also, you know, the relationship between architecture and glass. And I had been, I think, so concerned about feeling like I had to pick a camp and feeling 
like not knowing quite how my all my architectural training related. And I realized in this moment that architecture was not did not define the parameters of what I did, but that it was really just the beginning. And it was the most liberating thing. And it's been it was such a turning point, and it really was that instant. And I remember going into the house and saying to Michael, Oh, I figured it out. And he said, You didn't know that already? He's like, everybody else has known that for years. So it was obviously a bit late to the party, but yeah, at least I made it, I guess. And actually, I, four out of the five pieces for the last two summers that the show has been up have actually been fully illuminated by the sun, uh, which is kind of remarkable if you consider the climate in Scotland. <laughs> um, but I also, I'd always, I'm always so taken aback that I can never take a photo because I just, every time the sun comes up and the sun comes out rather and lights up these pieces, I just burst into tears and I can't take a good picture. So this is really one of the few that exist. And then, so actually in between making the, the work for the buyer and hanging it, I had spent a period of time um, in the glass workshop at the School of Art um, of the Australian National University in Canberra. And I, that, I, during that time, I'd actually been looking at how to cast those perspectival forms, the three-dimensional forms. But having made the work for the buyer prior, prior to going out there, I was already thinking on a much bigger scale. So whatever I cast was never going to be quite big enough. And then I was invited to come back to, to Canberra then in what would have been our winter. It was their summer, thankfully. Um, so I went back out there after the buyer installation. And having had that revelation about my own practice and where I was going, I went in and I, I already had the glass that was left over from my previous visit and I really hit the ground running and I started to produce this series. Um, so this was all, this was really I, what I consider in many ways to be the beginning of the series of the piece that hangs upstairs. So these, all the glass for this was cut by hand. Um, it was a very arduous process, it, was, it wasn't, it was quite time consuming. Um, and then the surfaces were all, uh, well, there were, some of them were machine finished, but also there was a lot of hand lapping, hand work there. And the pieces are all about domestic spaces. And I, I suppose I, I travel a lot, or I have done in the last couple of years, and I don't really have a base as such. When I'm not traveling, I bounce back to Caithness um, at home. And so I spend a lot of time living in places. And there's often longer periods of time, you know, from a month to four months, in places, homes that aren't mine, which is kind of interesting because you're, you know, you're inhabiting somebody else's space. So these are all about uh, houses or places that I've lived in previously. And for the first time, I started to make work that wasn't about Caithness. So the, those, these first two pieces are about in a, a flat, an apartment I stayed in in Edinburgh. And this is about a house that I didn't actually live in, but I spent time in, in Scrabster on the North Coast. And then I made my first international piece, which was about the apartment I stayed in in the School of Art in Canberra. Um, and it was, really, it was a really transformative time as well. I had such a lot that happened really within the last couple of years, but to be able to go and spend time in I, th I think in, you know, in a university, in an institution like that where I could be so immersed in a glass program when I didn't have that background myself. And I just, they said, you know, we know what you're trying to do. We can see it. We want to help you. Come and use our studio. You can, you know, give something back to us in whatever form that may take. But just come and see where it takes you. So there was no expectation. And but there was all the support and the critique and the facilities and just to be part of that community. So it was a real turning point. And it also it gave me a real kind of boost in confidence because I'm prior to that I had been the kind of person who would kind of keep myself just under the radar because I wasn't really just totally sure what I was up to. So at this point, I thought, okay, well I'm just gonna start applying for things. So that's what I did. So I applied for a new glass review. And I applied for a residency at the studio here at Corning, um, which was pretty instrumental. And when I came here for um, the residency, I really I was wanting to continue the work that I'd started in the buyer. 
and I wanted to make a body of samples that I could use as reference material for future installations. So I, prior to, to flying here, I had found a small space that I wanted to use as a site so that I could tailor my tests when I was here and take them home and that they wouldn't just be sitting on a studio bench, that they would be installed and have a context and I'd really be able to read them. So this is, um, well, it's a lot of things. It's a mill and there's also a smokehouse. So in the image on the right-hand side, upstairs in that roof space is a smokehouse and it's on the edge of Berrydale River. And so it, had, it was not in use anymore, but they would have smoked the fish that would, they would have caught in the river. And the space is four meters square and there are two roof lights. And inside, you can see the exterior and you can hear the river, but you can't see it. And the windows, as you can see, are, are cracked. So it's a really, the sensory quality of that space was really special. So I measured it before coming here. I did the same kind of process as what I had done in the buyer. I had started to trace the light with the chalk. And as I was exploring the space, I realized that I found this sign that marked, had marked at one point the level of flood water um, one year. There had been a, obviously quite a big historic flood in the area. And I thought, well, that gives me a date because the, in the buyer previously, the pieces weren't tied to a date that was significant in any way. It was really just when I was there to experience the sun being out. So I came to Corning with the intention of learning how to silver glass and to learn about how I could treat the surface so that I could affect how the light was then bounced back into the space. And I came here and I was, we were on our tour on the first day and one of the docents spoke about the flood that I'd been here and I had no idea. I'd never been to Corning before I came on the residency and she was speaking about the piece that's by uh, Jamie Carpenter and Dale Chihuly and I, the, the coincidence in that was really striking so I called up my mum and I said hey do you want to go down the road to Berrydale and maybe send me a bottle of water from the river <laughs> and she said surely they've got water in America. <laughs> He's like yeah but you know so um, they drove the 14 or 15 miles down the coast and bottled up this water and sent it so that I could use, instead of distilled water, I could use river water to dilute the concentrate so that the mirrors I made were site specific and unique. I wasn't looking to make a perfect mirror, which is just as well because it's actually quite true. So this is a river, you can, um, a mirror made with river water from Berrydale and you can see the deposits that start to lie on the surface. And so I took the pieces back after the month here and I installed them in the space. And I had predicted, and you know, knowing when the, the date of this flood was, I could kind of plot it forward and predicted where, this, if the sun was out, where it would fall. And the sun came out. So maybe, I don't know whether I've got a future as a weather forecaster or a psychic or something. But um, so anyway, it worked. And it was really, you can see the different tones of color in the mirror. And then it was reflecting light back up into the space, into parts of the building that had never been lit by natural light before directly. Um, and also would really highlight the inside of that space is black with soot, um, quite a lot of it from the smoking of the fish. Um, so I think this is a kind of a to be continued project. It's, you know, it was just an experiment more than anything, but I think it's, it's got legs for something in the future. And so whilst I was here, as Susie told you, it was when I found out about the commission and so I got home and I was, I suppose, trying to digest and decide what I was going to do. And I, the one thing I did know was that I wanted to at least finish the work in Leibster at Northlands. And the other thing I felt was that it should come from a sketch that I had already done but hadn't realized, because there were plenty of those and I felt if I tried to come up with something new, I would just be, be far too much pressure on myself. So, I went back to a sketch that I had done when I was out in Canberra and I think I'd sketched it actually on my first trip and it was about, this is the corner of our family home where I grew up, where my parents still live and it's in the summer, um, in the evening, the light will come right through the space and it's a very, there's a very particular kind of tone in the golden hour um, and it's always been something that has been a really strong memory for me. And I found a comparison in the light when I went out to Canberra, first of all. 
And then in the second trip, I went out there and it was summertime and I came home at the end of January and it was 40 degrees in Canberra, they were having a heat wave. And I came home and I did the journey from Canberra to Caithness in one go. I like just to get all my traveling out of the way. And so 36 plus hours of traveling, went to bed, woke up. It was winter, it was really dark. The light was not like this, it was completely flat. And it was really, I was just so out of it. I was so strange and so disconnected from it. Um, so it seemed like the perfect thing to carry forward into this piece. Because it really was the strongest feeling of disconnection that I'd had in such a long time. And so started from the sketch, started this process of drawing it up, of deciding on scale. And the other thing that I had decided knowing that the purpose of the commission was to allow you to explore an area that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to do, was that I was going to really push the nature of the work and to use a water jet cutter to cut all those really fine lines of black and also the really sharp angles in the white, both of which are very tricky or sometimes impossible to do by hand. So. I got in touch with the University of Sunderland and the National Glass Centre who have an amazing facility and I said, hey, I have this, this drawing for this piece. So I, there was a lot of back and forth and Susie and I went back and forth quite a lot on scale trying to determine uh, yeah, which, which was the right scale for the space. And so I broke down the drawings into, you know, figured out how, what I was going to cut out of which sheet. And there was a lot, I make this seem very straightforward. It was, it's been a very long process. The water jet cutter, just as I was about to begin cutting the final piece, broke and was out of order for, I want to say two months. Which is interesting because a lot of this piece for me was about, using the water jet cutter was, was it, to make work is an interesting thing because a lot of my research was really about our over-reliance on technology as architects and the lack of being hands-on. And here I was kind of giving everything over to a machine that as soon as I turned up to do anything, just decided that some critical part would, that was now obsolete was going to stop working. Um, so the irony of that is not lost and it is now funny at the time, not so much, but, um, and so this is um, the water jet, that's the, the garnet, the grit that they used to to cut there on the surface and the head of the water jet cutter at the back. And this is um, Dr. Jeffrey Sarmiento who was um, exceptionally helpful in making this happen. And he's standing on the bed of the water jet cutter. So I cut all of the components, cleaned them and started to assemble the jigsaw. And this is really where the water jet really came into its own and this is so this is a six millimeter, so what's that in like inches, Susie? Small. We've been going back and forth between inches and millimeters for the last couple of days. It's six millimeters deep. It's, it's really, and then it's really, it tapers really thin. So it goes down to two millimeters from about four at the other end, which is something that I would never ever have been able to do by hand. So then, yeah, assembling the jigsaw and then assembling it in the kiln. This is uh, Lauren Wilson, who is, or was Jeffrey Sarmiento's assistant, who very kindly agreed to assist me in loading the kiln and all the preparation. And here she is inside the kiln. I made her pose for a picture. She's very pleased. And here's the piece loaded and ready to go. And it came out. And I'd actually, this was the second time I'd made this piece because I cut all the components before the water jet machine broke, before the cutter broke. And when I took them out of the kiln, I called Susie and I said, I think it's too small. Um, so this piece is 0.35 bigger than the last one. Um, and so then I had, to, I had to collect it. I'd gone back up home after the piece came out of the kiln. I'd gone back to Leibster to prepare to start the cold working. And my dad said, oh, I'll, you know, I was going to hire a van and drive down. And he said, I'll drive down. We, you know, we can bring it home together. And I thought, okay. 
And then I think you realise actually just how far it is, because it's a full day's drive to get to Sunderland, because it's really it's the north of England and we're the very north of Scotland. So we compensated by stopping, and my dad, that used to be a boat builder, I should mention that, we, um, we stopped in every, what felt like every fishing harbour on the east coast, so he could inspect how they made their creels, so he could pick up tips for his own, uh, for his own thing. And I, sh I actually should mention that a lot of, and I, you know, I, th I actually thought Susie was going to mention it, so I didn't write it in. But the piece is really about, I remember when my father built the house that my parents live in at the moment. And I remember being, and I was quite young, being fascinated with how the timber in the windowsill, the joints in it were almost invisible. And it just really fascinated me. And there's one that is a really deep sill, and then on the wall that's perpendicular, it's much shallower. And I used to always really enjoy, but was never really permitted to, sit in the windows and read or draw or whatever. And I just have, it was a really strong memory of that, the light in that corner, and of just the nature of it. And I could, like, it's so vivid. I mean, I'm thinking about it when I'm standing here speaking. But it was such a strong memory that that's really what it's about, I think, is about that craftsmanship and that finish and the seamlessness of it all. So the piece that's up there is about that corner window, those two windows, how they meet. And then there's a picture frame that hangs alongside. But I can speak more about that in the gallery. So we made this epic journey. We made it up and down the road without any fighting or incident. Um, and I took it to Northlands and I started to cold work. Um, which is my favourite thing to do. And it was, being in Australia really taught me such a lot about cold work and they have what I think of as the Australian finish, that beautiful matte finish that's yeah, just, you really want to touch it. And so it shaped up and the surface started to emerge. And we got closer to completion. And then one day I found that maybe I thought I might be finished, which seemed like almost it might never happen. And then the art handlers came, and I've never dealt with art handlers before. It was a new thing for me. And I was sitting in the middle space that you can see, you, can, you can't see it because the lorry's in front of it, but I was sitting in there when they turned up in this truck and there's a long vertical window. And I just saw the cab of this truck coming across and I thought, surely not. And I went outside and sure enough, here's this enormous lorry come to collect my three crates, crates of glass. So, um, yeah, they came. And an hour later, they had packed it up they screwed the lid on and they put it in the back of this cavernous lorry and they weren't picking up anything else. They picked up nothing on the way up and they were driven all the way from Glasgow. And the day, I know it is crazy. And the day before, I was asking them all about what they did because I thought it was kind of fascinating. The day before they'd been in Edinburgh transporting a 10 million pound money and they were about to drive to Germany the day after they got back down. And the week prior to that, they had been, they'd taken a mummy, a sarcophagus down to I think the British Museum in London to be scanned. And on the way north, they'd taken back, and the guy is exact words, we took back a load of stuff for the Queen. So, and he says, so what is it that you're doing? So I kind of had to tell him the story. Anyway, it was pretty nice. And here is, I don't know how I get this to play. Can play? Yeah. Here we go, depart in Main Street Life Center. It was really rotten weather, really the tail end. I think of a storm that had come from here and everything was horizontal. And I stood at the side of the road and watched until I couldn't see the truck anymore. And I went back into the studio and, I th and it was just empty and it was just me in the cold shop. And I thought, well, what now? But this is what now, uh, really. Um, yeah, it's, it's very surreal to, to be here and to stand in front of you all. And it's even more surreal to stand upstairs and see this piece that has been the length of the country in Scotland quite a few times and so much. There were a few moments where I didn't really know if it would happen. And Susie throughout was, had no doubt and got a sense, particularly when the water debt cutter went down and she called me up and she said, look, it's going to be fine. And I was like, well, it's very easy for you to say. And she says, she says, it'll be fine. She goes, I have absolute faith. She says, you know, it, it, you know, 
it will be fine, because if worse comes to worse, we can project it onto the wall. <laughs> and there were a lot of points where I thought, you know, maybe that's actually what we're going to have to do. I thought I might have to get a Sharpie out and actually draw that on. <laughs> um, and I, you know, my list of people to thank really is um, pretty extensive. This, it, these are the main players, I think, the people, the institutions who have really given me the opportunity to explore the encouragement, the elbow in the side when I wasn't applying for things that I probably should have been applying for. Um, but I do think the biggest, or my biggest vote of thanks certainly goes to Susie, because without Susie's completely calm nature, and I you know I'm relatively calm, but Susie was just like, yeah, don't even worry about it. Um, it made the whole thing so much easier, and it's just, Everything has gone so smoothly since we finally got the piece out of the kiln, so I would like to thank Susie <laughs> profoundly. Um, I'm going to leave you with a video which Michael Rogers shot in The Buyer um, a couple of years ago. And really for me, and I think when you look at it, you might not make the connection straight away th with the work that's upstairs. But as I said, I think that you know my work really is about, oh, I keep touching that, the sliding scale between attachment and detachment. And it's really about either the presence of light or the absence of it. So it's either about experiencing it or missing it. Um, yeah. We had to slow it down. I don't move that slowly. Thank you very much. Are we done? <laughs> that was so great. I hope you feel the same way. Um, so, we have no time for questions now, but we do have time for one-on-one -on -one questions upstairs in the admissions lobby after that, but uh, after this, after the following, which is to say, um, I loved that Carlin put up that big list of people that helped made this, make this piece happen, which is a great opportunity to realize how important the community is, our community, all of you here, um, the Glass community locally and internationally. I am so thrilled that there are so many representatives of our local and sometimes not so local schools. Um, so I appreciate that, your guys' support for what the museum does and particularly for Carlin. Um, and it is also my um, real pleasure to present a gift that comes all the way from, uh, from Australia. And Richard Whiteley at Australian National University in Canberra. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the ANU team sent these lovely flowers. So, on behalf of So now, I release you upstairs to coffee and dessert and one-on-one -on -one questions. Thank you. Oh, what? Oh, yeah, and of course, to look at the piece again. And if you haven't done it in person yet, I, ho I hope it knocks your socks off as much as it knocks mine. Great. Thank you. Thank you.